welcome to your my place to Wednesday. Wednesday, January the eighth, year two thousand and fourteen. First show of the new year. Thank you guys very much for joining me here uh, on tonight's show. We will not have the Sig. We've got um, she is off to the local high school for an orientation for the little Sig. Little Sig is going into grade eight next year, so that's high school, secondary here in Surrey, so they're headed off there to get an orientation. And it's really interesting. The, the little Stig is very excited about going to high school. She's been bemoaning the fact that she hasn't had a chance to get to junior high school yet. She's in grade 7. And when we moved from Canmore to here, she went from elementary. She thought she'd be going to secondary or senior secondary, but she's back in elementary, whatever. It's very important to her for, for her to be going to high school, so it's a big deal. The funniest thing is, the interesting thing is, we were talking earlier in the week about college and what she should look for in a college and whether UBC or SFU, University of British Columbia or Southern Fraser University, the two big ones here in Vancouver. And it's, it's like, I'm looking at her and be like, you're 12. I couldn't spell college at 12. <laughs> She's talking about, you know, she wants to go for a drive out to UBC and take a look at the campus and up to SFU. And uh, good for her, good for her. And we, we both we both told her the Sig and I told her that you know don't worry about what you're going to major in right now. You, you're 12. You're only going into grade eight. Worry about that in a couple more years. So that's where the Sigs are. They're uh, at the high school orientation. Uh, so it'll just be me and our good friend Jim Downpole from The Loop at loopinsight.com. We'll be talking about, obviously, CES. It's the biggest electronic show in North America going on all this week in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank God I'm not there. I so appreciate the fact that I can't go. I don't know if I'd want to go. Uh, you have to pay me a lot of money to go to CES. It's an awful, awful, as I've always said, if you're not exhausted at the end of the day, you're not working hard enough at CES. It's a difficult show. But we'll, we'll talk about CES and the news that we're coming out of it. Uh, mostly it's stuff that, like every other CES, is a lot of hype, quite frankly. Uh, it's hype that is unjustified for the most part. Uh, there's no doubt that most of the things that we're going to hear from CES are for products that are irrelevant for the most part ridiculous at times, uh, that the consumer market doesn't really care about. Uh, a few years ago, it was tablets. A few years ago, it was 3D TV. A few years ago, it was whatever. There's always been a massive amount of hype around CES. And it's interesting to see how much of that hype is generated by the tech media itself. And we'll talk about that later on the show. Let's talk to Jim Downpool about his thoughts about those kinds of things. CES certainly is a look into the future, but I don't think the future will be what it is today. In other words, the things we're seeing coming out of CES today won't be the things that we'll be actually using in a year, 18 months, two years' time, but they'll lay the groundwork for that in some respects. In, in some, Monty says, I want to go to CES just once, just to see the, oh, shiny. Yeah, if you're not working CES, you know, if you're going... As a gadget geek, it's great. It's still exhausting. It's one million square feet. For those of you who have been to Macro Expos in the past, especially the big expos of years past, it doesn't compare. There are booths as big as the North Hall of the Macro Expo. The North and South Hall of the Macro Expo is about, a, I would say, a quarter of the size of a full CES. So if you walk Macro Expo or it's tired at the end of the day or at the end of a couple of days, imagine how evil walking a CES would be. It's just, it's a brutal, brutal show. Arc Science says, CES, the elephants of tech retail doing a show for the folks in the Clown Cars Brigade. Not far wrong, all right? He's not 100% right, but he's also not far wrong. So we'll talk about that with Jim a little later on. Uh, as always, uh, email on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. Love getting emails from you guys. Uh, join us in the IRC chat room. Thanks to the folks at net. Oh, sorry, at uh, irc.chat-solutions.org. You can join us on the Pound Your Mac Life channel. Or if you're not an IRC, we've got it set up. 
Our good friend Monty set it up so that you can go to yourmaclifeshow.com. And right there on the front page, he's already got the IRC already queued up for you. So you can watch the video of the show and watch, read, participate in the IRC at the same time. So we encourage you guys to do that. Over the holidays, uh, I realized... I'm oh, sorry, not at all. Let me back up. Back in October, I bought, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, a 13-inch uh, retina display MacBook Pro. And I used it as my everyday machine. Then I started, I wanted to retire this, what I'm looking at right now, this 15-inch MacBook Pro. When I bought the retina display in October, I asked why there was only one port on the side for line in or for audio. Uh, we can hear Jim playing guitar. No, I did not know that. Let me mute Jim here for a second. Jim's joining us in the ARC chat room, and, and he's, 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 he's mellowing out by playing guitar. Let me, let me mute him. There we go. He's muted. Uh, thanks, Sly. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so Jim's muted. So... I, when, when, when I asked the guy, he said, oh, no, that's an auto-sensing port. And I said, what, what does it mean? He said, well, it knows whether you've plugged in an audio input or you're listening to headphones. You want audio up. Okay, that's cool. So I started testing this out over the weekend. It didn't work. The headphone thing worked. Audio in didn't work. Line in didn't work. So I called up Apple Tech Support. I checked on Apple's website. It said auto-sensing. I called up Apple Tech Support. They said... Oh, it auto senses, but it only auto senses Apple's headphones. This is the only thing it auto senses. I'm like, well, that's kind of useless. And the guy said, well, no, because there's a microphone on there. You can, you can. Yes, that's fine, but what if you need multiple inputs? Oh, well, then you just buy a third-party use. No, no, I don't want to buy more stuff to make this thing work the way the previous generation worked. For those of us old-timers who've been using this for a while, we know Mike, Apple did this before. I think the original Mac Mini didn't have a line in either. And we bitched a fit about it, and Apple put it back in another machine. So I never thought they'd take it out again. So because I don't travel anymore, and because I've got the retina display hooked up to a 30-inch cinema display, the advantage of the retina display, the advantage of a 13-inch MacBook Pro were lost on me. I didn't take it to the coffee shop to do work. If I'm going to go to a coffee shop, I'll take my iPad Air. I didn't even see a huge difference in the screen. My eyes, granted, are going, but I never looked at that screen because I'm looking at the 30-inch cinema display. So any of the advantages that I saw of the MacBook Pro Retina display were lost on me. The SSD drive? Well, I've got an SSD drive in a 15-inch MacBook. Our friend Maurice Chevalier put one in for me. So there was no, no need for the machine. So I go into um, the Apple Store on, on Monday, and I tell the guy, I say, I, I, I make a Genius Bar appointment. So I'm just going to mute to, ah, no, that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to do that. I go into the Apple store and speak to, let me get his name right, Jason Roberts. Jason Roberts at the Apple store in Guilford Mall here in Surrey. And I gave him my, my, my sob story. And Jason said, and I, the other thing I said too was I was told by an Apple store employee when I bought the MacBook Pro, that if it was a Christmas gift, I had till January 7th to bring it back. That sounded kind of fishy, but I, I confirmed with the guy. He said, yes. I mentioned this to Jason. He said, eh, not really, because you bought it in October. I bought it in late October. He said, you're well past the return date. Yeah, I understand. I, I, I know what you're saying. He said, look, here's what we'll do for you. We'll take the retina display back. Really? November, December, three months. I had that thing for three months, and they're taking it back. That's remarkable. I mentioned this on Twitter, and someone said, we couldn't name another company that would do that, especially a tech company. No restocking fee, no nothing. 
no hassle, no big fight, no, and I had this whole, I spent the whole weekend with a script in my head of how I was going to firmly speak to these guys, not raise my voice, but very sternly talk to them about how that this was their fault, it wasn't, and they should do this. Did it without a problem. No problem whatsoever. The only problem was the little dongle on the end of the power cable. You know how the, the, the power cable is the brick and the, the part that plugs into the wall comes out of the, the brick part and then there's another dongly bit that goes on to the power, uh, the power brick. I can't find that. I don't know where that is. And he was like, eh. I said, I'll, I'll find it. I'll bring it back. He said, okay. That was it. ArcSign says, does the non-Retina MacBook Pro have audio in? I, I don't know about the new ones, but this version d does. The 2012 or 2011 model does. So to Apple as a company, thank you. To Guilford Town Center Apple Store, thank you. To Jason Roberts at the Apple Store in Guilford, thank you guys very much. You saved me a lot of hassle and got me rent money for the next couple of months too. <laughs> so there's that. Speaking of, no, I wasn't speaking of, speaking of, of, of Christmas, I wasn't, but I'm just going to badly segue into that. Here's my Christmas present from my good friend, our good friend, uh, our official Jew of your Mac life, Lauren Finkelstein. It's a box, very nice, solid wooden box. This is a very, very nice box. And when you open the box up, inside the box are little chocolate penguins. Isn't that, look at that. Isn't that cute? Little chocolate handmade penguins. And this is from uh, Lauren Ficklestein, his lovely wife, Karen, from uh, L.A. Burdick, Handmade Chocolates. They are the chocolate penguins, dark whipped lemon ganache with lemoncello, almond arms, Dressed in dark and white chocolate. Oh my god, these are so yummy. I've been spending a whole week fighting off the cigs from not not eating these things, but now that I've shown them off on the show, we're going to eat them. So thanks very much to to uh, Lauren and Karen for doing that. Uh, send me an email to uh, on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. Want to hear from you guys about what we talk about. So slice to the surprise? Yeah, so am I. Absolutely surprised. I I literally had I counted them. I was constantly counting them to make sure the six had because they're Italian. They have a bigger chocolate problem than I have. So you know I was able to make do with other chocolate, but those two are just complete chocolate fiends. So yeah, every every day I'd open the box and check to make sure they had they hadn't eaten them. Let's uh, let's get Jim down up on the on the on the line here. Jim, hopefully you're listening or maybe not. Let's see if I can't unmute him. Jim, you there? What? Jim. Oh. What? what? <laughs> Jim, turn me down. You know what? My my video isn't working. Yeah, but I can hear myself, dude. Okay, well, call me on my phone. I can't call you on the phone. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Hey, how come? Oh man, why can't you call me on the phone? Because if I called you on the phone, Jim, then I wouldn't be able to get you on video. But and the I, video doesn't work. You're not going to be able to get me on video. I, I understand that, but I can't get the. We haven't set it up with the audio inputs for the phone yet, so it's okay. No, I'll go get my headphones then. No, it's okay. It's okay. I, I, no, I'm going to get them. I'm going to walk upstairs. And... <coughs> you ain't you ain't that good looking, man. It's not that big a deal. We can do it. We can do this. Oh, you, so you don't you don't need me to do it? No, not at all. All right. Well, see, this is why I wanted you to rehearse this early this afternoon. But you I said, don't know. It's it's a problem with my camera apparently. Yeah. yeah. It's, it says it's, that, you know it says you don't have a camera. Well, yes, I do. So, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you you are at CES this week. How is Las Vegas? <laughs> never, <laughs> never. 
Sorry I interrupted your show with, I was just sitting there, you know, noodling around. That's okay, that's no big deal. Have you, uh, have you ever been to CES? Yes, twice. How, how, long, how long ago? How many years? How many centuries, decades ago? Oh, that would have been in the mid-2000s, I guess. Yep. Um, so, I, went, I went down with John Seff uh, twice and covered it uh, from Macworld. And it was just awful. I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> I just I pity those people because you know yeah. John and I would run around as much as we could, but what are you supposed to do? I mean, you know, there's a hundred thousand people and thousands of companies, and you just can't do it. No one person can possibly cover CES. Not no. the whole show. It's, it's, yeah. I, I I would be willing to say no five people could cover the entire show adequately. Well, and that's why people like Engadget and Gizmodo and all that send like everybody. Yeah, yeah. And and they they probably still have trouble covering it all. Now the the problem I have though is that now one of the great things about it though is that if you're a Mac guy, if you're an iOS device guy, if you're an Apple guy, CES has has partnered uh, I guess about five years ago with iLounge to create the iLounge Pavilion, right. which is a great spot. Because they, they kind of get all the Mac guys or all the iOS device guys all in one spot. Now, that's a bad thing from the point of view you get to see 8,000 case manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, and it's not as interesting. But it's easier to cover the show when there are so many, at least iOS device companies, all in one area. But that space is getting so big. That's That space is now bigger than a Mac World Expo. Is it, I've, I've never seen the space. It's, it's as of this year... It's a third larger than the largest Macro Expo. But you don't get, you know, the sessions and stuff, I guess, is the, the big thing for Macro people, right? Well, the other thing is you also don't get software. You don't get to see companies. I mean, Adobe will never be in the iLounge pavilion. Uh, those kind of companies. The software kind of manufacturers and vendors are, are, are very rare to see them in the iLounge pavilion. The iLounge pavilion is, for the most part, focused on both hardware and iOS device hardware. Now, there's a few more companies bringing some more Mac hardware. Uh, let's see, or Seagate this year showed off their idiotic sphere hardware. Did you see this thing? No. It's it's a sphere. It's a, it's a, it's a circle, which is kind of cool. It's silver-plated. Okay, it's kind of cool. It's a one-terabyte softball-sized drive, so they're doing something different. Because every hard drive is a rectangle of some description. So they're doing it round. It doesn't make any difference whether your hard drive, whether your backup hard drive is round or not. But it's quote unquote a only one terabyte. <laughs> Ow. And B only USB three. And C worst of all five hundred dollars. Wow. For a one terabyte drive. Wow. Five, now that's it's but then again, I paid uh, a thousand bucks for a one gigabyte drive when Apple first released them. So. Yeah, with years ago. But I went to the Apple store yesterday and bought a Seagate drive, a four terabyte Seagate drive, for hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's there's certainly big differences. And then Lacie had that iPad drive, which looks kind of cool. The fuel, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I I don't get it. I really don't. Why Why do you need that? You've got an iPad. It's supposed to be mobile, and now you're lugging around a hard drive with you? What are you doing making all that noise? Ah, oh, jeez. I'm turning things off so that it won't be so noisy. <laughs> and yet, in the process of turning those things off, you're making more noise. Just sit quietly in your chair. Yes, Mom. <laughs> okay, I'm sitting quietly. But the, one of the problems I have with this is something I've been, I've been writing about with the tech media on these kinds of events is that there's no filter on these things. So the tech media, everything is great, fantastic, new, wonderful, buy it now. Yeah. There's no, I mean, everyone who, who wrote about the sphere sort of said this, cool looking, don't you dare buy it. <laughs> you know, because you'd be a complete moron to spend 500 bucks on a silver softball to use a one terabyte backup drive. That's idiotic. Another example was, uh, did you see the story of the, uh, I think it's called the Colibee brush, the, the connected toothbrush? Get out of here. 
I sw remember last year it was the haptic fork, the fork that would vibrate if you ate too fast. My number one idiotic product of CES this year, it's a haptic toothbrush. Well, now I don't, I don't to, like make, that. to make the haptic toothbrush worse. The Verge and CNET and the other guys, simply, you could tell by the writing style, they just either took verbatim what the PR person told them, or they cut and pasted it from the press release. Because the first thing I would do with the claims of this Colibee brush is talk to a dentist. <laughs> Will the brush do what it claims to do, Mr. Dentist person? Okay? And then, this is the other problem I have with CES in general. The Colby brush is going to be priced between nine hundred, sorry, ninety-nine dollars and two hundred dollars. Now you know why there's such a huge price difference. Why? Because it's not a real frickin' product yet. It's not even a Kickstarter yet. The <laughs> Kickstarter, the Kickstarter will start this summer. <laughs> They're at CES. The Verge is doing a whole big blowjob on them. CNET is saying, oh, this is a great thing. It's not real. This should not be in the news cycle. But there they are. And there's dozens of products like this. And the, the, the people who, who read this stuff, who are online reading this stuff, unless that's made perfectly clear, the media isn't doing their job, which to me is to vet and tell us what's important and what's not important. I think I posted the best story of, of all. Which one? For CES. I'll look back at CES in 1970. 1970. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I meant what I said in there. I enjoyed that story more than I enjoyed any other coverage of CES. I usually look on the first day, and that's it. I did enjoy, uh, what's that guy's name from T-Mobile, Legere? Legere, yeah, Canadian. I, I did enjoy that he uh, he reminded people that uh, that there was a mature warning on his keynote. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He's a he's a foul mouth guy. Isn't he? I like him. Yeah, I like that. And the whole story of him being thrown out of the okay. So there's two there's two stories we have to talk about uh, from the the personality point of view. The T-Mobile guy getting thrown out of the AT and T party. What do you think of that? They should have left him. Why? Well, two reasons. First, who the hell cares? No. Because, you know, AT&T could have said, I'm glad that they that he enjoyed our, our stuff so much that he had to come. Yep. And the second thing, if you throw him out, it's only bad press. Yep. Uh, what's the difference? Leave yep. him. Exactly. It was a huge mistake on AT&T's part. Yeah, Absolutely I mean, just idiotic. There was no reason to do it. It's not your corporate boardroom. No. And apparently, didn't Legere get uh, the tickets from the team. Yeah, uh, the, the, the band gave him tickets. Yeah. So then he goes and, you know, he goes to the show after the band gave him tickets and they, they throw him out. Oh, man. That's just terrible. But then again, the band gave T-Mobile C CEO uh, tickets to the AT&T party. Yeah, so. But then again, the band may not have known. The band's PR person may have just, you know, known the PR person from T-Mobile and, Come on. you know, just giving them tickets. I don't think the band was trying to cause trouble here. I think it's just no, a, no, no. But they probably won't play another AT&T. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, this was a, this was a non-story. This is yeah, first of all, I think it was silly for Legere to go, and then it was silly for AT&T to throw him out because if they hadn't thrown him out, no, no story. Zero, well, none. Yeah, the only story there would have been, I thought it was funny. I laughed. I chuckled yeah. when I saw it. Yeah. And I posted it because I laughed so hard. Yeah. Uh, but if they hadn't have thrown him out, somebody would have seen him there because he had the bright pink shirt on. Yeah, he always does. Somebody would have taken a picture of him, and that would have been it. You know, T-Mobile shows up at, uh, at AT&T's party. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, but now it's it was a big thing. The best part was Eric Chang at CNET taking credit for getting Legere thrown out because it was his photo that he claims that AT&T PR people saw and had Legere thrown out. Way to pay, pat yourself in the back there, Eric. Wow. The next one is, I, I don't know how to feel about this one, Michael Bay. Is 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 Michael Bay to be pitied in all of this? Or no. is, this, is this just hubris on his part and we should mock him? We should mock him. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, if if he can't 
talk about his own work yep. for, what, 30 seconds or a minute? Yep. Then he doesn't deserve to be doing anything. I mean, he should just go off somewhere and be quiet. It was a spectacular meltdown, though, wasn't it? Oh, it was It was brutal. It was. I loved every <laughs> minute of it. Sorry, what was that? I loved every minute of it. <laughs> Oh, it's a little bit harsh, but yeah, it, it, it was just wonderful to see this guy could not talk extemporaneously. Huh? You see that? Yeah, I saw that. About himself and about the product he was there to pimp. I mean, I could get up on stage and talk about Michael Bay's movies and a curved screen TV with absolutely no prep whatsoever. It's not hard. Oh, it's beautiful. It's 105 inches. It's going to look great in your living room. How hard is that? Yeah, it's and always people, gotta say. And you know, and 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 people saying, oh, you know, maybe he's not used to public speaking. He directs movies. <laughs> you don't. I mean, he walked off because the teleprompter got mixed up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he probably mixed up the teleprompter, to be honest. I yeah. mean, yeah. Um, but when you're looking at something like that, um. And, and again, you can't say, if, if you and I were talking and we had a script, I would have studied it, yep. you know, because I'm going up in front of thousands of reporters and I don't want to look like a dick. Mm -hmm. So I would have studied the script, and then all of a sudden it, it goes off, and you could see the Samsung guy even try and help him. That's right. Why don't you tell us about the curved screen? <laughs> no, no, I have to go. <laughs> God, I wish you could. I wish my camera was working. <laughs> I just did a great cry scene there. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It wasn't just a matter of him not knowing what it was and stumbling through it. It was him, yeah, almost crying and walking off the stage. That was just magnificent. Oh, it really was. It it's really funny was. that it's funny that CES every year has that one keynote. That just everyone's talking about the keynote, not because of the product, but because of something else that happened. Every year. Well, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know how all of these keynotes keep screwing up with people. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I know how apples go off so well because they rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. So, you know, if it works, then it works. I don't know if these guys don't rehearse them or not, or if he just messed it up. I, it's also just a matter of arrogance on their part. Oh, we don't need to go through rehearsal, or I don't need to read the script, or I don't need, I don't need, I don't need, whatever it might be. Maybe. But yeah, you're, 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 you're right. It's Apple and Steve Jobs and Tim Cook and all those guys who just, relentlessly rehearse these things. They'll, we know, having talked to Apple employees, I know some of the guys in the, in the AV department who work behind the scenes in this stuff, they start rehearsal three months ahead of an announcement. They start practicing. They start blocking things out that far in advance. A month away from an Apple announcement, they're rehearsing at least two hours a day. And then the week before, every day, all day, they rehearse over and over and over again. And, you know, it looks kind of effortless when they're up there. Yeah, well, you, you rehearse something for three months, it'll, it'll be effortless. Yeah, and by the, by the time that, that they're up there, it, it is effortless, you know, because they've done it so many times uh, that they can do that. But, you know, the, that's the, the kind of thing that Apple demands that, yeah. that, that they do. Now, we don't know that, that Samsung didn't rehearse theirs for months either. All yeah. we know is that Michael Bay screwed the pooch mm -hmm. uh, on the night and it just did not work and instead of you know manning up and saying okay you know teleprompter screwed up so let's just let's just take this here's what I do and you know here's how this is going to help and then the Samsung guy could ask him questions and you know it could have been a back and forth type thing and they could have salvaged it and it would have been great yep that being said what do you think of these curved TV which is the new hype of CES, 4K TVs and curved screen TVs. Is this something that you have any interest in? How, how big is your TV at home? Uh, 55, I think. And when did you buy it? Uh, two, or th two or three years ago. Do you have any interest in buying another screen that size inside the next five years? No. Well, no. How big is it? 
Uh, they start at like 65 inches. Um, I don't know if I would want a curved TV or not because I, I don't know what the viewing angles and stuff are like. You know, for me, I, I just want something that's clear and, and fairly big and that I can see. I kind of sit off on an angle to the TV. Yeah. I don't sit directly in front of it. So if the viewing angle, if that messes up this curved TV, then I probably won't get one. But we don't know. I mean, I don't know that yet. So when I go out to buy a TV, for me, it's probably like most people go buy a phone. It, it's got to be, you know, I, I have to feel like I'm getting good value for the money, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of money, but mm -hmm. I do enjoy watching movies and, and things like that. So I just want things to look nice. I don't so, know that there is enough compelling... Uh, evidence is the wrong word, but there's, there's, I don't think there's enough to compel people who either don't have an HD TV already, or who have bought one in the last, say, two years, three years, maybe even four years, to buy a curved screen. Now, well, apparently, the curve is makes a better viewing experience, and I'll, I'll grant them that. But any TV, 40 inches and up, HD TV is going to give you a pretty damn good viewing experience already. It's, it's not going to, I can't see it getting much better. I, I, when I look at, at my TV, um, I, I don't think, you know, I see the, the TV announcement today and I don't think, oh, man, you know, my TV sucks and yep. I want to go buy this. I don't think that. I, I go up and I look at my TV and it's beautiful. It's HD. Um, I have an LG, by the way. Yeah. Uh, in my living room, and it's a great TV. Uh, it does everything that I need. I have my Apple TV plugged into it. I, you know, I have my sling box, and away I go. Yeah. So, I, 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 I think it's very much like the whole 3D phase of a few years ago. There's just not enough there there. You know, there's well, not enough there to make me say, oh, yeah, this is, this is great. I want, I want. 4K is going to stick around, I, w I would imagine, but you know, I, I don't know about the whole curve thing, and I, you know, I, who knows even when, when 4K TVs will become the mainstream. I mean, when I bought my TV, LED was was just out. I mean, it was probably out for for a little bit before before I bought mine, but uh, I knew that I wanted LED. That's right, isn't it L LED? Yes, yes. There's plasma and LED. So I didn't want the plasma because plasma was particularly bad for sports. And no, good for sports. And I, What? The plasma is better for sports. I thought it was worse for sports. Nope, that's why I bought a plasma. Oh, man. <laughs> Three years I've been watching my hockey game. <laughs> See, now, now I'm all depressed. You're joking with me, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. That's why, that's why I bought a plasma TV because I watch more sports than I do regular movies. Man, oh, man. All right, well, anyway, I bought it because it was supposed to be better for sports. Now I'm yep. all depressed. Now I am going to go buy a new TV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's one of the, the reasons that they told me. So, you know, obviously I don't know the difference. Yeah. You know, uh, we watch TV at, at night, you know, and whatever, HBO or Showtime or whatever, yep. some of these great series, and, and everything is wonderful, and, and it looks good, and, and that's as far as I, I take it. Yeah, exactly. I, I I don't take it apart. I don't, you know, if I if there's a, an HDMI port, I plug my Apple TV in, I turn it over to that one, and yes, it works. <laughs> I'm good. It's all I need. Yep, I agree. Yeah, it, it's hard to... This is another example of where I think the media falls fails us in the reporting from CES. We don't see any sort of critical thinking or critical reasoning behind these sorts of things. Yes, a curved screen, 65-inch screen of any sort is going to be gorgeous. A 4K TV is going to be beautiful. Curved screen, 65-inch 4K, oh my God, yes, I would take that if you dropped it off of my house. But am yeah. I going to go out and spend 4000 bucks on one? No. And the vast majority of people aren't going to because what they have now is perfectly good for what they, they do and will be for at least the next five years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, it would be it would be tough for for me to uh, to make a decision to go out and, and do that. Now, would I go out and buy a new guitar? Absolutely. Yeah. 
That's right. <laughs> oh, you mean the strings are different? I'll buy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that that would be great. Yep. Monique, Monique bought me two for Christmas. I know. I heard you, lucky fella. And yeah, did you see what I got her? Uh, yeah, you got her a pot of some sort, or oh, a garbage can, dustpan. Dustpan. That's right. Yes, you're such a nice guy. I gave her a garbage can two years ago for her birthday. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. And an ironing board one other year. That's right. And an ironing board cover. You know I follow you on Facebook, and I know I've seen you give your wife jewelry. So don't don't try to play like you're some hard ass. I'm not a hard ass. I'm going to give her the broom when she learns how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I did give her jewelry back in uh, in October. It was beautiful, too. I saw pictures. Yes. The next, the other thing about CES that um, I think is really going to be interesting is wearables. Now, the, the wearables, mm. a lot of folks will think a wearable it just means an an eye watch or things along those lines. But wearables is a broader definition of any sort of computer device that you put on your body somewhere. It right. can be a headband. Google Glass is a wearable. Uh, the Pebble Watch is a wearable. Uh, the the Fitbit. Uh, uh, fitness thing. I don't even know what it is because I can't use it because I'm fat. Um, all that stuff. Those are all wearables. Now, I don't think this is the year of the wearables. No. But wearables are definitely in the very near future, aren't they? Well, wearables are in the... I mean, if you look back uh, years ago, you would you would strap a, an iPod onto your arm. Yep. You know, in, in, in a very early sense, that was a wearable. Yeah. You know, because it did things, and you strapped it on. I mean, I I used to have a a, a, a strap for my Sony Walkman. You know, it's a bit different, uh, but you know, wearables are are communicating and they're doing things now. And yeah, I think if anything, 2015, maybe even 16, will be um, the year of the wearables. Uh, I I don't certainly don't think it's going to be this year. As much as I hate to give them credit, uh, ReadWrite, uh, ReadWrite.com has got a great line. What CES 2014 is really about? Your connected future, and that's I definitely will agree with them on that. That it's not about uh, the device that you can buy today or the device you'll be able to buy this summer. It's about the future of this technology. And whether that's a good future or a bad future, I don't know yet. No one does. No. See, because part of the problem with wearables is. For the most part, if it's wearable, it's also trackable. You know, well, by, at least by you and possibly by others. This could be the beginning of a dystopian future. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not being all all chicken little and the sky is falling, but there's certainly the possibility is there for this to lead us into in, in into a direction where we're being tracked 24/7. Things have changed, though. I mean, before we didn't really know how bad things were until we moved forward. Sure. Um, you know, so the first computers came out, and they were amazing. You know, the things that you could do in your home with these, you know, you could paint, you could uh, have a, a like a DOS-type spreadsheet, and you could do the uh, just incredible stuff. Now we look back and say, wow, that's terrible. Yeah. And, and I think to a certain extent we're looking – at the stuff that we have right now, and we're not saying, wow, this is incredible. We're saying this stuff is, is junk. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, so that's that's really how things have, have changed in a, in a short period of time. In a short period, I mean, like, you know, 30 years. Mm -hmm. But still, um, that that is quite a difference when we can sit back now and say, uh, Samsung smartwatch? Yeah, not so much. Yeah, yeah. That that doesn't blow my mind. That, that Samsung smartwatch wouldn't even blow J Dick Tracy's mind. Oh, absolutely. That's right. Exactly. I mean, this, these things are, I don't want to call them dumb devices, but they are dumb certainly from the consumer point of view. These are all right now, every single one of them, except maybe some of the fitness ones, and only if you're a fitness butt, buff. But the, for the most part, these are all geek toys. The Pebble smartwatch, geek toy. Yeah. Uh, everything else is just of, for, by geeks. And the problem with the tech media is they generally tend to be geeks. So they go to CES and they go, this is great, this is fantastic. But the average person doesn't want a Pebble watch. Yeah. They don't care about these sorts of things. Until the average person 
starts asking, caring, wanting these kinds of devices, they're going to go nowhere. They'll sell, as Mike Gartenberg says, you can sell 30,000 of anything. And they'll sell 50,000 Pebbles and 50,000 gear, Samsung Gears and yeah. 50,000 whatever else is. But these will never break out into the mainstream market because no one's figured out a way to convince the average user, the non-tech person, why they'd want to use these things. And that's that's the trick right there. That's yep. why... Apple has made it made the iPod successful because they were able to show the average user why they should have an MP3 player. Before that, I mean, people had MP3 players. There were lots of them on the market. Uh, what was the name of that company? Creative. Yeah, Creative Labs. Creative Labs. I mean, they had all kinds of them, uh, and you know, quickly went under um, at the hands of Apple, or their their sales did. Um, but. Apple is able to convince people why they need a tablet and why they need uh, a touchscreen phone. No. That's one of the secrets to the success. I mean, if if people take home one of these watches right now, they they don't care so much about being able to, to jigger around with it and everything. They just want something to work. And after you go through a few screens, and, and you must sit back and say, okay, now what? Yeah. What does it do for me? Well, mm -hmm. nothing. So, I've said it before, but I think people are taking the whole naming of this uh, watch, iWatch, or, you know, whatever it is, a bit too literally. Yes, I agree. You know, the products that are coming out to supposedly compete with uh, something that Apple hasn't released yet look like watches. They, I, I just, I think they look kind of silly. I think the worst. I think the worst news this week was that the uh, the iWatch is being delayed. Did you Did you hear this? <laughs> oh my God! This is awful. Yeah, and Apple is Apple is pushing the envelope of design. Really? Wow! First, first time that ever happened. Yep. Yeah. The uh, uh, the information. Apple's reportedly having screen technology, battery, and manufacturing issues while building the iWatch, a product that Apple has neither admitted to being working on, has ever announced, and has no intention of talking to anyone about. But these guys know more than anyone else does. And you know what? Even if all that stuff was true, who cares? Yeah. It doesn't matter until Apple announces the pro If Apple had said, we will have the iWatch out in September, and then some... Mickey Mouse website that wants to charge idiots 400 bucks a year says, but it's delayed, then I'd be worried. But for a product that is not announced, not acknowledged, not any way she perform a real product, I don't give a rat's ass if it's delayed. I agree. I, I agree. I mean, you know, the product can't be delayed. And, and to say that it's delayed because Apple is, you know, pushing the envelope of design or what, however they phrased it, um, Apple always does that. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, nothing is delayed because, you know, maybe Apple didn't plan on releasing it until 2016. Yep. Maybe it's actually early. I, <laughs> you know? I, I, I have a scoop for you, Jim, if, you, if you'd like to put this on the loop. Yeah, you got a pen handy? Here's, oh, my yeah. Here's my scoop. Apple's 15-inch iPad Pro is delayed until 2017. Huh. Damn. Ah, ah, now I'll bet you're really pissed off. I was looking forward to that. It's the same thing. It's the exact same story. Yeah. You could have removed the words iWatch and put 15-inch iPad Pro, and it would be the exact same story. It's yeah. Just, I, it, it's I, just I, idiotic. I the media jumped all over this. Well, and that's, you know, it's that type of story that I think um, could have been held back and nobody would have been the no. wise. That's you know? Right. I, and nobody gained from it being released. Nobody would have... Uh, lost anything if it wasn't. Oh, I disagree. Jessica Lesson probably gained a few subscribers at 400 bucks a year. Well, I suppose. See, that's part of the problem with, one of the problems I have with her site, is that because everything's behind a paywall, it can't be vetted by anybody other than the paying customers. And the paying customers aren't going to vet it because they expect her to do it. So she can say whatever she wants. And the media fumbles all, falls all over itself posting this stuff. But there's absolutely, but there, it's all a single source story. It's mm -hmm. only coming from one person. Do you have a subscription? Hell no. <laughs> Even if I had 400 bucks, I wouldn't pay for crap like that. Because her other big story was that Scott Forrestal is back from vacation. Really? That's worth 400 bucks a month? Yeah. I could have talked to the paper boy for that. 
I don't I don't have a subscription either. You better not. No. Speaking of subscriptions, although it's not a subscription site, David Pogue brings Yahoo Tech to life. Have you uh, checked out the new Yahoo Tech website? I did take a look. I didn't like it. No, I, didn't, I wasn't a fan of it. A, no RSS feed. And I know it makes me old school, but I, ne I need an RSS feed, especially for such a visually heavy, cluttered page as that yeah. one. I, I didn't like it at all. What do you think of uh, Pogue's tone? Um... Well, I, I don't know. I, I asked because I hadn't seen this. Our good friend uh, Greg Gear pointed this out to me earlier uh, during the pre-show. Now, I saw his Yahoo Tech intro. Right. And it was David Polk. Uh, that's what you get with Polk. You either like it or you don't like it. If you don't like it, nothing he does is going to make you happy. So I'm not going to critique that. But apparently he also did a CES presentation that was a little bit different in tone, a little more snotty and snarky towards those other websites. Uh, Slashdot has an article called David Pogue and Yahoo's Normals Problem. Apparently, Yahoo Tech is going to target the normals, as Pogue said on the CES stage. Uh, during his presentation, Pogue flashed slides that made fun of competing tech brands. The Verge was rendered as The Urge, for example, while Gizmodo became Gizmoody. So, you know, he's being, he's being kind of cutesy. But the thing is, he says <clears throat> in one of the slides that all the tech geeks live in New York or San Francisco, and the rest of the country is made up of the normals. And that's the target market for Yahoo Tech. Okay, and I understand that. I don't agree with them. There are lots of normals in San Francisco. There's lots of tech geeks in Iowa. Yeah. But the idea of, 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 of them, this is their target market, Okay, I get that. I understand that. But then you look at the Yahoo Tech website, and they're going to be reviewing Kickstarter projects. They're going to be reviewing Kickstarter projects. You better say that one more time so that review, I understand. Review prototypes. What they're going to do is they're going to contact Kickstarter projects and say, hey, you know that prototype you have? Send us one and we'll review it on Yahoo Tech. There could not be a single more useless review in the world except maybe beta projects. Wow. Maybe if you're reviewing an alpha of iOS 8, that would be a more useless review. But the idea that you review a Kickstarter project, but then by the nature of Kickstarter, the product isn't real. No. It's still a prototype. It's not, not rendered properly. It's not, it hasn't got the, the fine tuning of it. It may not work. And they're going to review these things for the normals? It makes no sense. It makes literally, it literally makes no sense whatsoever. Is it? You're not going to help me out with that? Jim? I lose Jim? Oh, come on! Jim? Jim Darrell will join this video call. All right, let me get Jim back on the back of the line. You there, Jim? Jimbo. Hey. Hey. How you doing? Good. Sorry about that. That's okay. It happens. It, it just stopped. Kaka occurs. So, yeah, I um. I agree with you. I don't think Kickstarter stuff does any good, but you know, I'm not a fan of the site either. Yeah, yeah. The site uh, itself, well, and 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 what's your issue with the site? Is it the same as mine? Is it busy, or are you talking content? Well, no, I I don't even know about the content because it's so busy, and when you click on one of those squares, it kind of opens up into the story, and yep. it, it's. I know that they're trying to be different, and they're trying to be clever, and yet you you give them credit for that. Sure. But I give them the same um, type of credit for that that I give Microsoft with the Surface. You know, I gave Microsoft some credit with that. Mm -hmm. I think if Yahoo wanted to be different with a tech site, they should have done something very clean and very simple and let the content rule. And right now, the content doesn't rule on that yeah. site. No, it's, I agree. It, it, it's messy. And the other thing is, they make such a big deal of being different, of, as he said on the CS stage, this uh, the site for the normals, and yet 
look at who he has writing for the site. It's the same middle-aged white people that every other site has. He's yeah. got the he's got the, the 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 obligatory two females, but they're just as geeky and white as everybody else. There's no diversity there. Now I'm not one of those guys that says everyone has to have, you know, one black, one Jew, and one guy in a wheelchair in every single website. But if you're touting how different you are, and yet no, your perspective almost, is the same, we almost have that. <laughs> <laughs> But if but if you're touting how different you are, and yet your your tech perspective is coming from the exact same people who write for Engadget and Mashables and Gizmodo, how can you really be that different? Well, and I I, I like Rob. Pagaro, yeah. Yeah, I like Rob. Um, yep. That one I think was a a good hire for them. I I just think that <laughs> imagine if the site had to come up as as this clean beautiful um, looking site, how different that would have been compared to, um, you know, The Verge and all yep. of these. They, they kind of drove themselves into the exact same pocket that they're trying to get away from. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and then they have, they have things like, so they've got Pogue's review of the, uh, the, the Mac Pro and that kind of stuff. And then they have this, now you can see what you would look like as Kim Kardashian or Barack Obama. Really? Come on, guys. Yeah, can't, we, can, can't you do better than that? Can, what, why do you have to, to wallow in the same cesspool as the Mashables and the Engadgets of the world? Yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to wait and see the content, but I'll be honest with you. I went by yesterday to have a look at it, and I cringed, and I never went back. Yeah. Yeah. So Now, I didn't listen, unfortunately. I'm sorry I was busy this morning, but I, I saw your synopsis of Amplified. What's going on with your Mac Pro? Oh, I don't have one. Why? Why not? I thought you were getting one r right away. No, I'm I'm gonna get one, but it, it no, it just hasn't come yet. Oh, That's okay. I thought for some reason there was a mix-up or there was something oh, going on. Okay. No, right. no, no, no. Um, no. Lost you again. You still there? No, nope, I think we lost Jim again. We'll give him a few seconds. Do 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 do. What do you guys think? Send us send me an email to onair at yourmaclifeshow dot com. Have you gone to the new Yahoo Tech website? Does it interest you? Does it uh, have anything? I mean, I don't want to say it this way, but are, are you one of the normals that uh, Yahoo Tech is targeting with this this website? If so. What do you think of it? Do you think this is something you would come back to on a regular basis? I know I won't because it doesn't have an RSS feed. Without an RSS feed, there's no website I will go to on a regular daily basis because I need I get through my three, four hundred websites a day through RSS. I can't go to a page that every day that just I have to type in yahoo.tech.com or whatever it might be. I just can't be bothered. If you can't be bothered to make it easy for your viewers, and I'm even okay with RSS feeds that have what they call um, uh, something feed. Some, some RSS feeds will have the entire article in them, and others will just have a synopsis. I'm okay with that, because if your synopsis is well-written or interesting, I'm coming to your site to read the rest of the story. But without an RSS feed, I'm not coming to your site. Unless someone links to it on Twitter, or I see it linked somewhere else, I'm not coming to yahoo.tech.com on any kind of regular basis because it's just it's just too busy, too hard in the eyes, and just too much work to find to find out the information. Uh, so another thing I'm seeing a lot about at CES is, and this has been around for a long time, it never really caught on, but it seems to have a few more entries into the market at this particular CES. And I don't think it's a good idea. There's a there's this iPhone compatible wearable life blogging camera, and all it is is a little a little device. It's called the Narrative, and it's a little device that you hang on your jacket pocket. And what it does is, for you folks watching the video, I'll I'll, I'll uh, put this link into the video. And what it does is at a predetermined time. It takes a picture. 
So every, what is it? It's got a 5 megapixel camera with GPS that automatically snaps two photos per minute. Why? Why, 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 why do you need to have two photos snap per minute of anything? Because you're walking around the mall. You're walking around your office. You're going to school. He's back! God. Yeah. Yeah, this is fun, isn't it? This is terrible. I don't know what's going on with my connection tonight. Well, yeah, I know you've had problems in the past, that's for sure. I was just talking about uh, the other idea I'm seeing a lot of at CES, the idea of uh, it's a wearable life blogging device. I've seen four or five of these getting pimped on uh, various websites. I, maybe just me, but quite frankly, my life isn't interesting enough to live blog. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to see anybody's live blog. Yeah, I, I don't care. I don't. Uh, I don't care that you're gonna. It's this is sort of like the idea of the vacation photos that our parents would make us sit through, or our parents' friends would make us sit through. You remember the old slide projector thing, the clunk, 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 sitting there in the dark yeah. living room. This feels kind of like that. I didn't like that then. Why would I want to watch the live blog of your life? Yeah. Who freaking cares? I mean, no, uh, it's, and, and you know, part of it is is the fact that I'm 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 against following celebrities anyway. But maybe this is a celebrity thing. But for the average person, I I honest to God don't care. Well, it just gets creepy, I think. Well, it's not, certainly not as creepy as Google Glass. You know, Google Glass is without a doubt, and I love. Uh, did you see the article by uh, Matt Honan? Uh, late late uh, in December, I glass hole my year with Google Glass. Did you see yeah. this? Yeah. The best line of this, and I've been on Matt Honan for a while now. Everyone seems to think this guy is some sort of writing guru or god. I think he's an idiot because he writes things like this. I wanted to wear Google Glass during the birth of our second child. He says, I have no idea why my wife was resistant to live casting the birthing event. Are you a moron? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's a difference between wanting to do it, and we know that's a bad idea, but secondly, not understanding why your wife says, if you do it, I'm shoving those glasses up your ass. <laughs> yeah. How could you not understand that? How could you be so so tone deaf to your relationship that you would literally write the words, I don't understand why why my wife says no? And who would you show that to? That's the next question. Not me. Not me. I don't care how much beer you got in the house, Matt. Yeah. But the whole article is just more of that. It's just more of him showing he's a moron. He doesn't understand why people hate Google Glass. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. Some weird shit on on your face, he says, that that he just doesn't seem to get why people don't like Google Glass. It's just the most remarkably tone-deaf article I think I've ever seen written about Google Glass. Well, I, I'm not, uh, not going to argue with you. Uh, maybe Matt was joking, though, because Matt's usually a pretty good uh, judge of things. But I disagree. I mean, when he says, when I wear it at work, coworkers sometimes call me an asshole. <laughs> How much of a bigger hint do you need uh... that this thing is wrong... Then if your coworkers are calling you an asshole. Yeah, well. Jeez. <laughs> right. People stop by and cyberbully me at my standing treadmill desk. I think he just hit a triple play there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Google Glass, standing desk, treadmill. I'm yeah. gonna trip you on your face. Yeah. This is why I don't like this guy. I just don't like this guy. Alright, you you win. <laughs> just... But he says, and this is the very interesting too. Here's the thing I'm utterly convinced of, he says. Google Glass is coming. You can make fun of Glass and the assholes like me who wear it. But here's what I know. The future is on its way, and it's going to be on your face. Do you agree with him? No. No, neither do I. Neither do I. I don't, no. think, I don't think Google Glass, at least in its present form, will ever catch on with the same people who were talking about wearables before, normal people. Yeah, I, I just, I can't, I can't think that, 
that it's all going to be on the face, but we don't know where it's going to be. I mean, people have tried so many things. They've, they've, uh, you know, uh, jackets and shirts that have pockets for for things, and they become wearable and yep. up into your, you know, uh, ears and stuff like that. I I don't know. Who knows well, where? It'll be. Well, that's why I say in its present form, Google Glass will never catch on. Because as as Mont as a uh, MacMan says in the RC chat room, if I ever see someone with them on in a restroom, I'll get arrested because I'd punch them in the face and stomp on them. Yeah. Go ahead, wear Google Glass into a men's bathroom and even look in my general direction. Yeah. I'm gonna punch you in your glass. Yeah. I guarantee them to you. Well, it's not. It's certainly not going to be good. No. I think we can we can all agree on that. This is the, the I think the ultimate tech geek toy. I have yet to see any publication, any person, because everyone spent fifteen hundred bucks to get these things, unless Google's given them to celebrities. I want to see Google give a pair of Google Glass to your wife, Monique. I want to see Google give a pair of Google Glass to Sly, to a normal person. And watch how fast they won't use them. Yeah. Yeah, they won't. But, you know, give me a car that drives by itself, and I'm not going to use it either. Exactly. I'll be, taking, I'll be taking the wheel from that thing. Damn straight. Yeah, I just I just another one of those things. Another example, we've been talking about it all night long, of things that the, the techies and the geeks and the nerds love that I don't believe are ever, ever going to catch on with average people. Yep. One thing that will catch on from CES and this is, to me, this is the most disturbing trend of the previous CES, this CES, and definitely 2015. The hottest new gadget at CES, according to the Los Angeles Times, is your car. The last thing in the world I want is a car that's got more gadgets on it, that's got more ways to distract drivers. Yeah. I think this is an awful idea. Yeah, it's bad enough as it is. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. I speak from the point of view of a motorcyclist. Gadgets in cars terrify us. Yeah. They utterly terrify us. We see now people on their cell phones when they're when legally not allowed to. We see now people looking in the back seat taking care of their children. We I saw a woman in Nashville change her 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 blouse driving down I-24 at 80 miles an hour. Got down to bra, changing her clothes in the fast lane. I'm on my motorcycle going, this is insane. Yeah. So, yeah, let's put more distractions in the car. Let's put more gadgets in the car. Let's put more things that will blink and talk and basically take my eyes off the road. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. I can't think of a gadget that's good in a car except for maybe GPS. And even that has a lot of problems. Yeah, they might almost want to take radios out. But the idea that I could... We saw that uh, last year at the Super Bowl. Uh, I think it was the Ford Focus advertised how you could update your Facebook page from inside your car. Oh, my God, no. Yeah. But they do put a warning on them and say, don't do this. Yeah, they also put up speed limit signs on the highway, and guess what? Yeah. No one pays attention to that either. It's just, it's just, it's just terrifying that there's so much of this technology is going to be put. The other thing is, too, that the technology that's in the car stays with the car. When you sell the car, you don't pull out the cool Bluetooth stereo. You don't pull out the, the heads-up display. You don't pull the stuff out. So you're going to be rebuying this technology over and over and over again. But new and better stuff. And if they but, didn't want to use it, they wouldn't put it in the car. Do you think that we should be working more towards preventing these kinds of distractions? That you know, We've seen people talking about how the iPhone, uh, with iBeacon, for example. An iBeacon in your car could tell which side of the car you were on and therefore not allow you to use the iPhone if you were in the driver's seat? Well, I, I think that people should use their common sense. 
if I look down and text, am I going to be able to see the road and drive at the same time? Probably not. So I won't do that. Yep. But no, people are stupid. And they'll look down and say, oh, yes, I should do that. We need less tech in cars. We need better drivers in cars. I mean, the, the first thing I saw was about four or five years ago, manufacturers started advertising these backup cameras where when you put your car in reverse, the, the display would turn into a backup camera. Here's an idea. Look behind you. Yeah. yeah. Like our parents did. Self-parking cars. Here's a better idea. Learn to drive. Yeah. Now, we're not old men. We're not crotchety old guys. We took the, our driver's test from the same time, and you and I both had to learn how to parallel park. You have to. Can you parallel park, Jim? Oh, yeah. Is it fairly easy? I'm sure. Now, I will admit, on the left-hand side of the road, I have more trouble parallel parking because, you know, you know you've, you've had less practice parallel parking on the driver's side. But on the left-hand side, passenger side, boom, I can parallel park with the best of them. Why the hell do I need a car that will do it for me? Because I didn't learn to parallel park. Yep. Yep. Oh, I don't and, like to parallel park. Then don't drive. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> and don't sit next to the parking spot, that, uh, you know, for a half an hour trying to figure out if your car can fit. Oh, my God, Yes. You lazy bastard, go find a different parking spot. Get out of the way. Yeah, because you know what? I can fit in there. That's right. <laughs> Folks, we're talking to Jim Down from The Loop at loopinsight.com. He has his own podcast called Amplified. This week's episode is The Angriest Santa. You can find it over on the iTunes store. Jim, even with all the problems, thanks very much for joining me, buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Sean. All right, have a good night. See ya. Bye. Loopinsight.com is Jim's website. I'm going to mute him now so he can go, go play guitar. Now he dropped out. All right, fine. Drop out. See if I can. Again, email on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. Thanks, you guys, very much for sending us emails. Um, did you guys... I don't want to mock those of our friends who are going through the deep freeze down there in the United States. And there's no doubt it is bitterly, brutally, evilly cold. Even as a Canadian, I look at those temperatures and go, oh, my God, <laughs> that's cold. Minus 50, that's cold. Minus 30, that's cold. And I'm not even saying Celsius or Fahrenheit because it doesn't matter. After a minus 20, it doesn't matter. Cold is cold. But the idea that this is some sort of cold apocalypse I'm sorry, from the point of view of us Canadians, we're like, yeah, this is the average for us. So when Canadians make fun of you, please take it with a grain of salt. Please take it with the, with the, 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 the love, the, the, the gentle mocking that we definitely intend it to be. Before Christmas, Maurice Chevalier in Calgary was saying that when he woke up that morning to go to work, it was minus 30 degrees Celsius. So this was well before this polar vortex or whatever it was. You all saw the story last week where for a period of time there in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, it was quite literally colder than the surface of Mars. <laughs> and that's not even unusual for Winnipeg. <laughs> I saw that sign, I saw that story and went, yes, yeah, so? There's a reason we call it winter peg. The, the, there's a famous uh, intersection in uh, Winnipeg, Portage and Maine. It's apparently, because of the design of the buildings, the coldest intersection on the planet <laughs> because the wind comes whistling down one of the streets. I've never been there in the wintertime, so I, I don't know which street it was. But apparently, it's, it's so cold there, the wind chill factor gets like even worse than, than, than before. So, yeah, I, you know, I have some sympathy, especially for our friends like Monty, Monty in, in, uh, in Atlanta. You know, you're not used to this kind of cold. Yeah, it's... It's bad. It's certainly dangerous. Your vehicles aren't used to it. You know, in Canada, a lot of us will have these cars we can plug in to in Canada and in northern northern United States. You can you can plug in uh, your car into uh, uh, an outlet to keep the engine block heated. 
your sword doesn't crack. That's how cold it can get in some blades, where your engine block will actually crack from the heat. I'm sorry, from the cold. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that, that you, that you guys, but... Yeah, it's we, we have to we have to at least make it a little bit of fun of y'all because some of this stuff is just hilarious. And and then there's some of these stories. The story you guys may have heard of of the freaking morons going out because they'd heard someone on Facebook talk about how what would happen if you went outside and you threw boiling water in the air. Okay, you know what? Yeah, every Canadian kid has done that, okay? Because that's been passed down from generation to generation. Every Canadian kid does that. Except there's at least 50 cases of people being burned, literally burned, by the boiling hot water. Now, the only way to get burned by boiling hot water when you throw it in the air is if you throw it into the wind. (sighs) Really, people? Are you that stupid that you would go outside in minus 50 degree weather with a pot of boiling water and throw it into the wind? Or the story I posted on on, uh, uh, Twitter this afternoon. The video, these idiots in Minnesota, minus 50 with the wind chill, going outside and peeing in the snow. You are a moron. I hope your dick freezes off. Okay? That kind of stuff just isn't funny. That's just stupid. That's just dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Mac man, oh God, they scalded themselves. Yep, that's exactly what they did. Boiling hot water in the air, wind blew it in their faces and on their arms. You're a moron. But yeah, it is it is definitely, definitely cold. So there's, now, and I say this as someone who is Nice and warm here in Vancouver. Relatively warm. It's three degrees. So it's in Fahrenheit, it's 34, 35, 36 degrees. So it's pleasant. It's raining here in Vancouver. The rest of the the rest of the, the, the country is under the same polar vortex as everywhere, everywhere else. So if you have to go out in that, don't. If, if you have... Um, an old winter jacket or old blankets that you're not using, old boots, basically winter clothes, winter supplies you're not using, please donate them to your local shelter or go direct to the source. If you see a homeless guy in the street, give him the boots, give him the jacket, give him the the blanket. But if you've got stuff lying around, take a look around your closet and there's clothes there that you're not using anymore. Go to your local Salvation Army, your local Goodwill, your local church. Don't leave that stuff in a closet. Get that out to people who can who can use it. Uh, what else we got going on? <coughs> Excuse me. Just checking, see what else I got. There was another odd story here from the folks at, at, uh, at Fast Company, fastcompany.com. Can Apple's Angela Arendt spark a retail revolution? Uh, Angela Arendt is the CEO of Burberry. She's coming to work for Tim Cook at Apple as the new retail vice president in the springtime. And my first th- problem with this story is the writer doesn't make it clear that this was an interview he did six months ago, long before she was even chosen as, uh, sorry, most of this interview was done before she was chosen as Apple's new CEO. But the idea that Ms. Aaron needs to spark a retail revolution at Apple, my first thought was, aren't you paying attention? Have you been in an Apple store recently? For you folks who are listening off the top of the show, I talked how I went to the Apple store and returned with no hassle whatsoever a three-month-old laptop. Does Apple need a retail revolution? Maybe they could use some sparking up of the stores. I've always said that the Apple stores are boring. I'd like to see them be a little more interesting and inventive with their design. But does Apple need a retail revolution? And what would that revolution be? 
Apple's already revolutionized retail. Apple makes more money per square foot in their stores than any other company on the planet. In second place is Tiffany's. You know the jewelry guys? And they make only half as much as Apple makes per square foot. Now, people will always be able to tell you horror stories about how they got bad Apple service. But I'd be willing to bet the vast majority of stories people talk about app, the Apple stores, the service, whether it's, whether it's just going into a Genius Bar appointment, whether it's a return, whether it's a sale, the vast majority, and I would say 80%, if not higher, of those interactions are positive for the customer. Now, are some of the Apple Store employees unhappy? Yeah. It's retail. Retail sucks. And it doesn't matter who you work for, retail sucks. Yes, the employees don't get paid enough. That's retail. Yes, they get worked too hard. That's retail. Yes, they don't get enough benefits. That's retail. And I'm not saying Apple retail. I'm saying everywhere retail. Apple's not breaking any ground there. So maybe that's where they could revolutionize the stores. Start paying employees better, offering more better benefits. I don't know. But from a customer-facing point of view, the Apple Store is the best customer service store I would say any of us go into. And I'm including every store you could possibly imagine. I'm betting the guys at the Ferrari Store aren't as nice as the folks at the Apple Store. I've never had a bad interaction. I've had problems. And I've had my concerns not be addressed, but never in a way that made me feel like I wasn't being listened to. So the fast company story, can Apple, Apple's Angela Aaron spark a retail re revolution? One of the things the guy says, Apple's per square foot sales are still the envy of retail. Net sales rose 7% in fiscal 2013. But morale has flagged as the retail operations has struggled, first through a season under an ill-chosen leader, then a year without any chief at all. Competitors have been, this a longtime member of the Apple retail team, competitors have been trying to emulate Apple's retail experience for quite a while. And Apple's been lucky that nobody has done it better. That's not a great position to be in, where the competition just sucks more than you do. I don't know. I don't think the competition just sucks more than Apple. I think Apple, from a retail point of view, is so far and away better than the competition that they can't catch up, that they don't want to catch up. I mean, it's not hard to figure out why Apple retail works from a retail point of view. No pressure sales staff. Products right out in the open that are easy to use. Uh, free tech support through the Genius Bar. Microsoft has all that stuff. What does Microsoft have? They don't have iPods. They don't have iPhones. They don't have iPads. That's mostly what Apple's selling in the stores. But then if you want a laptop, Microsoft hasn't got laptops that people want in large quantities. So it starts off with having a product people want to come into your store to buy, and then when they come into the store, making them feel good about buying that product. Microsoft doesn't do that. Samsung doesn't do that. Sony doesn't do that. None of those guys do that. But it's, it's just, I found it not to be a very good article, although people have been raving about it. To me, it's just, Apple doesn't need a retail revolution. But... Now, now, P. Booth says Apple is the Nordstrom's of tech. I'm not a Nordstrom shopper. I've never, I've only been in a couple of Nordstrom's in my life and never for shopping. I've always been following along Sly or somebody else. P. Booth, can you explain wh what that means? I, I don't know exactly what that means. All I know is that I shop in a lot of places, a lot of different kinds of stores, motorcycle stores, Starbucks, uh, any number of coffee shops and tech stores. And I have yet to experience the good feelings I consistently get going into an Apple store. Even walking to the store, you know it's going to be a good feeling. We've been fighting with Rogers, as one of the cell phone providers here in Canada, 
since we left Canmore. The can the, the Rogers retail outlets outlets suck. The employees are awful. They don't care. They can't do much in store. The computer system is down three quarters of the time you go to pay your bill. You start to pay your bill online, the website is down three quarters of the time. Then when you don't pay your bill on time, they ding you on charges. But I tried to pay the bill, but your website was down. Oh, well, sir, you should have paid. No, 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 no. His shadow says, those stores in the store make just as much sense for Microsoft as for Apple. But if someone a while back said every computer store was a Microsoft store, Macs were in one corner by themselves. If it wasn't a Mac, it was running Windows. That's absolutely true. But it's interesting. Let's make you guys the vice president of Apple, of the Apple retail stores. Would you change anything? How would you make the experience better? How would you create a retail revolution in the Apple stores? I've been thinking about this now since I read the article. I can't think of much. No, no, granted, I'm, I have a small caveman brain. Maybe I just can't think that far in advance. The only, the only thing I've ever complained about the Apple stores is the fact that visually they're kind of tired and dated, but that was Steve Jobs' look. He, he loved that minimalist wood and glass feel to them. But I could tell you that there's an Apple store in downtown Denver. There's an Apple store in downtown Portland. The Apple store here in Vancouver. You know what they look like. They all look the exact same for the most part. Now some of the stores will have a different framework. I think the Piccadilly, Piccadilly, yeah, the Piccadilly Square store in London is a perfect example of that. The building where the store is is a gorgeous old building with, with great ceilings and columns. But the store itself looks like the same store in Las Vegas, the same store in Miami, the same store in Toronto. I've had friends when I've been I've gone places, hey, you want to go to the Apple store? No. Looks the exact same as the one I got back home. No difference. I'd like to see that free up. But I understand why Apple makes them all the same. Same with, with McDonald's. Every Big Mac you have around the world is going to taste the exact same. Because Apple and McDonald's want you to experience that same thing. They've nailed the experience. They've perfected the experience. They know it's a good experience. So why mess with it? I get that. I don't have a problem with that. Monty says, the, the Microsoft store here in Atlanta is in Lenox Square. That's the same place as the flagship Apple store. The Microsoft store layout and design looks so much like the Apple store on the floor above it. Microsoft employees even try and look like Apple employees. Yet the Apple store is constantly overflowing with people, while the Microsoft store has more employees than customers. It's not just about the store. It's about the advertising, the product, the marketing the good feelings people have about this, the word of mouth. Microsoft doesn't get that. Microsoft thought, same with Samsung and Sony, so Samsung in the future, Sony in the past, if we just emulate the Apple retail environment, customers will come flocking in. That's not it. That's not the case. You have to have a product you'll want to come in to buy. Microsoft doesn't see that. They don't get it. It's not just cookie cutter copying the Apple stores in every way, shape, or form. Everyone tells the exact same story. The Microsoft in the mall, the, the, the Sony store in the mall in Portland. There was literally a Sony store directly opposite the Apple store. And no matter what time of the day you went in there, no matter what day of the week you went in there, Apple store packed, Sony store, say the Microsoft store, more employees than there were customers. It's about the products. Arc Science says, Apple stores must be doing everything right to have such a high sales per square foot number. I imagine there are updates and subtle changes over time to handle the huge increase in customer traffic they've been forced to deal with. Yeah, that's true. Remember, again, for us old timers, remember Apple, every Apple store used to have a theater in them? Now, there's no Apple store that's being built, a new one that has a theater in it anymore. Apple actually taking the theater out of many of their stores.
because the the, the original idea of the theater was to get people to come in for these free classes. And that's what Ron Johnson and Steve Jobs envisioned. I talked to Ron Johnson with this at the Apple Store opening in, um, I don't remember where the hell it was. Uh, maybe, yeah, I think it was Nashville. <clears throat> or Boston, it was Boston. And I asked him about that. He said, yeah, you know, we want to get people to come to our stores. That's why we're offering so many free services, the Genius Bar, and that kind of stuff. Well, they don't need to do that anymore. Apple fairly quickly found out customers... While they like the free class, Snapple still offers the free classes. The customers don't need a separate theater to sit down and take those classes in. Now, for the most part, they're doing it at the same desks, the same tables, as they do everything else. So they've taken away that space. You'll see less and less space for software, for example, from the Microsoft Store. Sorry, from in the Apple Store. That's one thing I would like to see Apple do, concrete thing. I would like to see them turn over their third-party products faster. It's the same case manufacturers in the store that was there a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. I think for variety's sake, for, cu for the customer's sake, and for the vendor's sake, they should turn that over every three months. Every three months have a different vendor bring in cases, have a different vendor bring in laptop bags, have a different vendor bring in hard drive, bring in headphones, and bring in whatever it might be. There are all kinds of good vendors out there. Apple's got a limited amount of shelf space that are going to designate for these products. So it's kind of socialist of me to say, let's give everyone a turn, but it also lets the customer see different products too. Let the customer see different companies in the Mac ecosystem. And let those companies reap some of the benefits of being in the Apple Store. I think that's really the only thing I would seriously change about the Apple Store. I'd like to see more products. And I understand that they're not doing software anymore. I'm okay with that. But when it comes to hardware, let's see more of a turnover in the hardware space. I was there yesterday looking for uh, a hard drive. And it was the same hard drive manufacturers that have been there six months ago. It's the Lacie. It's the same Lacie drives, too. Uh, it's a Seagate, and Seagate is Le C now. I'm sorry, Le C is Seagate now. Western Digital. Let's get something different in there, kids. Let's, let's, you know, refresh. Do things differently. Uh, I think that's it. I think that's we're going to get out of here. When it's, oh, we got an email from uh, Bob Studer. Bob says, Apple Store changes less crowded stores. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen at all. Apple wants crowded stores. The only way to make the crowds, the, the, the only way, Bob, the only way to make the stores less crowded is by having products that the people don't want as much. You want less crowded? Go to a Sony store. Go to a Microsoft store. The other issue is, the other way to fix the crowding problem is make the stores bigger, which is physically not possible for a lot of these stores. There are vendors on either side of Apple stores. And while well, I've never seen any stats on this, I'm willing to bet the stores within a general square around the Apple store are making more money than they were before the Apple store. I don't know. I, I'm just guessing. And if that's the case, those stores don't want to give up that retail space. The other thing is the stores next to the Apple store also have leases that they have to pay for. So they may not be able to just sell out to, to Apple. True, if Apple really wanted the space in an Apple store, in, in, the, in the store next door, say there's a, a, a Victoria's Secret store next to an Apple store, Apple could easily buy out their contract, their lease, and expand the Apple store. But the other thing about the Apple store, Bob, Apple wants the visual of the store being crowded. They like that visual. Because we've just been saying it right here. We look at the Microsoft store, and it's empty. The Samsung store, and it's empty. The Sony store, and it's empty. If Apple made a store that was, let's throw a number up there, three times as big, and if it looked empty, it wouldn't be. It's, it's the old Yogi Bear line. No one goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Apple doesn't want that. Apple doesn't want people 
to look at the store and go, oh, there's no one in there. I'm leaving. But consumers are like that. So, yeah, less crowded is least of Apple's issues. They're really not going to change that. Um, that's it. Thank you guys very much for joining us. This is the first show of 2014. It went very well. I appreciate you guys with the emails and the question in the IRC chat room. As always, we appreciate any emails you guys want to send on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. Even you guys who listen to the archive, let us know, send us emails, if you have any comments about any things that we've been talking about today. We hopefully will have the SIG back on next week's show. She was, most folks who might not, who might have come in late, she is off to a high school orientation for the little SIG. Little SIG is off to high school next year, so there's a, the local high school is having an orientation, so the little SIG has gone to check the school out and mom has gone to check the teachers out and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, hopefully they will both be back for next week's show. Until then, folks, I want to say thanks very much to all you guys for joining us. And as always, I've been Sean King, and you've been listening to your Mac Life. See ya! 